Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Hello, good evening. The good news is we now have a firm date. The Prime Minister told us this afternoon that by June the 1st we'll have a world-beating system in place to track and trace coronavirus across the country. We still have 12 days to get the 25,000 new trackers to a place where they can trace 10,000 cases a day. The importance of having this strategy in place can't be overstated. Track and trace, as the government has frequently made clear, is the, opening, is the key to reopening our schools, reigniting our businesses and getting life back to normal. It's unclear whether the Prime Minister had made the decision to announce the date before he was pushed by Labour's Keir Starmer. What has become more apparent this evening, however, is that some of the numbers the PM used in his exchange with the opposition leader do not hold up to closer scrutiny. Nick Watt has been going back over what was said. Nick, tell us what you found. Well, we had one particularly dramatic figure from the Prime Minister, £900 million, as he declined an invitation from Keir Starmer to exempt all care workers from the health immigration surcharge. Now, that £900 million is how much is raised from the £400 a year that all migrants have to pay um, to use the NHS. Well, the House of Commons Library has done a breakdown of those figures after a request from the Labour MP Seema Malhotra, who we'll be hearing from shortly in the programme. So let's just take a look at this first graph we've got there and absolutely the Prime Minister is right, £970 million is raised from this surcharge but that is raised over four years. The Prime Minister has counted four years to reach his rather large figure of nearly a billion pounds. Now, that figure is going to go up because the current £400 fee will raise to £624 in October. And then from January next year, all EU migrants wanting to come here, they too will have to pay the surcharge. Now, let's look at another graphic. Now, that £917 million shrinks to £35 million uh, pounds if you meet one of one part of Labour's demand, which is to exempt all NHS staff from uh, this fee. Now, in the, under the current rules, that would cost the government just over 10% of the roughly £300 million a year that is currently raised by the surcharge. Obviously, the Labour plan would be more expensive because they also want to exempt social care staff from this. Now, let's look at a final graph. Now we're down to £1.2 million pounds a year. Now, there has been doing an idea doing the rounds that a current limited exemption that that applies to some NHS staff could apply to social care staff. This is the idea that Priti Patel introduced, which is that if you work in the NHS and your visa is about to run out, it would automatically be rolled over. Obviously, Labour would, would want to uh, apply that to social care staff, so it would obviously costs more than that. So you're seeing a big gap then between that headline figure of 900 million that the Prime Minister talked about in the Commons and what looks like a, a figure closer to 1 million? Well. 900 million, you look at that and you think that's almost a billion and it will go up. But the cost of meeting part of Labour's demand, which is to exempt all NHS staff, is 35 million. Obviously, it would be more than that to have all care staff, but it would be considerably lower than the figure that the Prime Minister was keen for us to digest today. And Nick, I wonder if you think this plays into a wider concern. You were at the press conference asking about the remarks made by Robert Buckland today about whether priority had been given to the NHS over care workers. That's right. I did ask Oliver Dowden about that. And I said, did the Lord Chancellor's marks, were they a bit more open? Did they contrast up with the way in which prime, the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's Question appeared to brush aside concerns from Keir Starmer about the level of early testing in care homes. Now, the Culture Secretary, he uh, uh, rejected uh, that analogy, but then he invited me back for another question. Nick, would you like to, to ask any follow-ups? Yes, could I just come back to you, Oliver Dowden? You're saying that you're not glossing over anything, but there was a very different tone from Robert Buckland today when he was saying maybe things could have been done differently. And it's well known that mistakes, honest mistakes, may well have been made, particularly in the beginning phase of this public emergency. And wouldn't it do this government some good? Wouldn't it do the government scientists some good if you followed the example of Emmanuel Macron and acknowledged, admitted, were open about those. There's going to be a public inquiry. You're going to be called up before that public inquiry. So why not begin that conversation now? Well, of course, uh, in any uh, public health crisis like this, there will be a time for lessons to be learned uh, afterwards. But I think the public rightly want us now to be focusing on dealing with this. That is why 
uh, we have introduced the NHS uh, Care Homes Action Plan, having the consequences I described. And on some of the points you raised, for example, uh, in relation to people who've been discharged from hospitals into to care homes, actually the numbers discharged in March, April were 40% lower than those in January. And it has been the case that testing has been available to care homes right from the very beginning. And it has been the case that, uh, that we have issued guidance right from the very, very beginning. Of course, there are always lessons to be learned, but I think it is worth reflecting on, on those things. Culture Secretary Oliver Dowden, we also heard that very clear data commitment to track and trace, having the system up and running by June the 1st. Well, it's interesting. We heard that the Prime Minister wasn't knocked off his stride by Keir Starmer when he asked him about the NHS uh, surcharge. But earlier in their exchanges, was it a slightly different story when Keir Starmer pressed the Prime Minister on the track and trace system? In his initial answer, the Prime Minister said he had great confidence but by that by the 1st of June, he would have a testing and tracking system in place. Then under further questioning, the Prime Minister phoned that up and said, yes, it will be in place by the 1st of June. Q front page headlines tomorrow about a relaxation of the lockdown. Nick, thanks very much indeed. So the big question, can we meet this new hastily acquired target in the time frame given? And will we ever truly understand why that strategy was abandoned so early on back in March when so many more lives might have been saved? Here's James Clayton. There was a time when we were a nation that contact traced. When Steve Walsh, who picked up the disease in Singapore, was diagnosed in Brighton, Public Health England shut down two GP surgeries and isolated five people who'd been in the same pub as him. But on March the 12th, a decision was made to stop doing this. Today, though, an announcement that it was to begin again in England. Already, we've, recru we've recruited 24,000 trackers, and by the 1st of June, uh, we will have uh, 25,000. They will be capable of tracking 10, of the contacts of 10,000 new cases a day. During this conversation about contact tracing, we've heard a lot about this app. Does it work on Bluetooth? Does it correspond with other phones, etc., etc.? Well, forget about the app. It's a bit of a red herring. It would be nice to have, but it's not essential. What we absolutely do need, though, is manual contact tracers and lots of them. Contact tracing is not about downloading an app on a smartphone. The absolutely crucial part of this is nuts and bolts public health human resources directed at the task of contact tracing. Uh, digital technology is a useful add-on, but it's not going to solve this problem. Here's how the contact tracing will work. If a person tests positive, a contact tracer will identify anyone they've been in close contact with. Those contacts will then be classed as either low or high risk. Contact tracers will then get in touch with people who might be at risk. They might be asked to isolate or get tested themselves if they start getting symptoms. Each of the four nations are doing this slightly differently. Northern Ireland, though, is the real exception. It's already started contact tracing people who've tested positive using pretty low-tech solutions, people in call centres. So why, as England begins to relax the restrictions, this was Brighton today, is contact tracing not ready? We stopped contact tracing in uh, mid-March um, and we could have been using this period to have started that process. Clearly it was unmanageable when the cases were very high, but we could have been building up the workforce, getting the training done, but instead we paused it and we're now playing catch up at speed. Um, and that, that's why it's so challenging and people are worried about whether it's going to be feasible as we go forward. So will the government hit this 1st of June target? Well, in theory, yes, they should. They've had literally months to prepare for this, but there are signs that they're not totally ready. Yes, they've recruited 24,000 contact tracers, but how many of them have actually been trained? I asked the Department of Health tonight, but they wouldn't give me an answer. To get us out of this lockdown, Boris Johnson says he wants a world-beating contact tracing system. That's certainly not the case at the moment, and he now has 12 days to turn that around. 
That was James Clayton. Well, we invited the government to join us this evening. Once again, they said no. Joining us now is the Shadow Employment Minister, Seaman Malhotra, and the Conservative MP, Tobias Elwood, and Professor Christoph Fraser from Oxford University. Now, he's leading the team, providing advice to NHS X on that tracing system. And we're going to talk track and trace uh, in a moment. But first, I, I just want to turn to you, Seema, to... to perhaps clear up those figures on the NHS uh, levy, because they're pretty complicated just to, to take in um, for our viewers. H how do you explain that £900 million figure that Boris Johnson used in the Commons today? Well, I was very surprised that he used that figure and it immediately asked questions, which is why I asked the House of Commons Library to look into this for me. And what it shows is that the 900 million is in line with a figure from the House of Commons accounts, which shows how much has been brought in from the immigration health surcharge over the last four years in total for those who are here in all occupations, not just the NHS. And what was surprising was that figure was used as the reason why the government wouldn't consider exempting healthcare workers from the immigration health surcharge, those who are coming to our country to work in the NHS, effectively paying for NHS services themselves. What is true is that the government has had a temporary um, uh, kind of cancellation or exemption of that charge for around 3,000 workers. And, uh, and that is uh, for those who were, whose visas were due for renewal before October this year. And if the government was to make that exemption permanent, that's where you get the figure of 1.2 million. If you take the figure from House of Commons uh, figures that show the total number of those outside the EU who, um, who are working in our NHS, that's about 88,000. That's where, if you multiply that by the surcharge figure, you get the 35 million. So, so whichever figure you use, it's, it's not far 900 less million. Than yeah. the 900 million, which do, is a figure for the total for four years. Do, do you think that he didn't understand those figures then? Do you think he was taken by surprise? And are, are you getting signs that, that this would change his response to it then if it's so much smaller? Well, it's either that he didn't understand the figures, in which case you have to ask the question about why he didn't know and whether he's been briefed and indeed whether or not the Home Office had actually looked at the cost of the exemption uh, for NHS staff. Because I was surprised at the way he used that figure. I very much hope that in light of the clarity that's come from these figures uh, this evening, that the government will reconsider this. Because at the end of the day, we know that it's our NHS staff who were at the forefront of, uh, of saving us from this um, horrendous coronavirus. They're the ones who are putting their life at the risk. At risk. Yeah. They're the ones we clap for every Thursday and they are the ones who we need to ask the question now in a fair immigration system would we want them who are coming to work in our NHS to support us and save our lives to be paying for NHS care themselves. Uh, okay uh, Seema thanks very much I'll put that straight to Tobias Elwood I know you're not of the government but, but uh, you are of the governing party I, I wonder if you want to respond to that Tobias and, and answer that question would you really want uh, these workers who are, as the Prime Minister admitted, saving his own life to be paying that surcharge on a service in which they actually work and contribute when it's so minuscule. You, you make a, a very powerful point and I completely agree with Seema there. Uh, if one of the positives that's come out of this very testing time that we're going through is the value the, or how undervalued the key workers are, not just in hospitals but also in care homes as well. But we haven't got to the stage yet where Keir Starmer hands his questions before Prime Minister's questions to the Prime Minister so he can get the detailed answers. Sure. And uh, so the figure that was used, I'm sure it was not designed to somehow mislead, as we are doing now, as I'm sure it'll be done tomorrow, that there will be follow-ups. What I would say, though, is, is that you wouldn't make policy on the hoof in Prime Minister's questions. What I am picking up is an absolute desire to revisit our entire care home operation, the support that's actually given right across that sector. And I think we're going to see a huge review. That would so, be the time to make a judgment on this. It wasn't not exactly on the hoof, because you'll accept that the question had been raised in previous days, not least um, 
with Priti Patel uh, on Monday. But am I hearing from you uh, the sense that actually you would be more proud of your party if they went along those lines and relinquished that levy on, on care workers? It's one aspect which will be looked at. As I say, I want to see a full review of the care sector, which has been, uh, I think, ignored for too long. And we're seeing that. We, you're absolutely right how curious it is that we clap every Thursday night now appreciating what they do. But for many, many years, it's been undervalued, not just in the Tory government, but in Labour as well. It needs a, a real full review okay. to understand and appreciate what they're doing. Christoph, I'm going to turn to you um, to talk track and trace, because you're right at the centre of this um, system. And it was very exciting to have the Prime Minister so confident that this could be up and running uh, by June the 1st. Does that sound doable? Well, so I, you know, not involved in the, the operational aspect, but I would say the, the whole program has been developing uh, at pace. We've seen large scale up in, in testing capacity, recruitment of the, the, the manual contact tracers and development, uh, the aspect which, which I've been most closely with, the development of the app uh, for NHSX. And the idea is to get all of these systems to work together um, to, to implement contact tracing and, and keep the infection under control while allowing us to have, have more movement. Uh, so and, and so let, let, us, um, let us imagine for a moment. I mean, a lot of people remembering, you know, early March, February as the heyday when we were all able to go about our business normally. H how many people have to be using the technology, the system of track and trace for us to get back to those freedoms? What percentage? Well, so to go right back, so so we've developed simulations um, uh, to 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 test this, and to go right back to to that level of freedom would require a, an uptake of about sixty percent of the the population, which is um, somewhere around eighty percent of smartphone users, uh, in order and good adherence uh, in order to keep the reproductive number below one and to keep the epidemic under control. Now, at this stage, that's not what's being proposed. We're proposing keeping, you know, a, a cautious exit uh, from lockdown and, and keeping social distancing uh, going. So, so the extent to which uh, contact tracing can make up for, um, uh, you know, make up for, for relaxation in our contact rates depends on how those two two things tra uh, trade off against each other. Yeah. It also depends on how quickly the testing is being turned around, how long you have to wait for a test, because you know the, the infection is transmitted very quickly. So you need to get the information very quickly. And it also depends on the efficiency of the manual uh, contact tracing. So uh, it, it's really all about having enough freedom in the system uh, and putting in as much into each component uh, that that uh, that's what's going to buy us sort of more freedom in terms of being able to to return to some aspects of of. of uh, let, let me ask you, just to go back to Tobias. Um, a lot of people were quite surprised that second time round we got this firm date of June the first. We keep on having these targets, don't we? Dates or numbers that are often not met, and I wonder. Uh, whether you, you hold your breath every time, you know, we hear 25,000 tests by mid-April or 18,000 ventilators or, uh, you know, regional testing centres by the end of April, all these things that aren't met. And, and we've got another one today, which, which could easily be a hostage to fortune, Tobias. And I hear that and I understand that. But let's understand that this is all unprecedented. Setting a high bar for everybody to attain gives the direction of, of travel a clear goal of where we actually have, have to go a fresh mindset for people who have never done this before to say, let's get on with this. I absolutely agree that data is important. I'm reminded me of, of, reminds me of my Shrivenham days where the more data you have, the better decision making you make. Data gives you information. Information gives you intelligence. Intelligence gives you wisdom. Wisdom allows you to do, take you towards action. And so, that's what we need. And I also make the point, because I know you love your numbers, but ultimately it won't be just uh, the, the contact tracing which will get us out of this. It will be our continued discipline of self-distancing, of actually being disciplined and educated to move us forward until the vaccine is there. So the data will help, absolutely. But it's actually the result of the nation working together.
that will see us through. Yeah, but Tobias, you've got to be realistic about this. We can't stay in lockdown forever. So the data is what is helping us to get schools back, to get the economy back, to get normal life back. And I wonder if you're such a fan of data, how you can explain the fact that when we had the chance to do track and trace right at the beginning in March the 12th, that was just abandoned. That is a question you're going to have to put to government. It could very, be, very well be a technical issue because we were being inundated in the NHS. Don't forget the first death in the UK came on the 6th of March. The first death in China came on the 11th of January. We were shipping PPE across that way. An awful lot was happening there. There was a concern that our hospitals well, would be deluged. So there may have been a focus That didn't work there, either, did it? Denied. I mean, let's be honest. Uh, Seema, are you, are you feeling positive now that you've been given a date that we can all work towards this June the 1st? Presumably, that tells you where Labour should stand now on, on the schools policy. You would, you would now back the government getting us back to school on the 1st of June if the track and trace is there, wouldn't you? Well, you raise a very important point, which is about confidence to go back to whether it's school or to the workplace. And I think what's in incredibly important about the discussion we're having is about how lockdown isn't a strategy in itself. What you do need is an effective track, trace and isolate system that's going to give people the confidence that because that's the way you're going to control the virus. Of course, but if and you're if you're you need now to be able to get back to school and to and to work, because let's face it, we're going to need a serious employment strategy as part of our exit strategy. Sure. And I think what's can, what's can I just shown... ask though? But presumably, that the whole point of, of the prime minister being able to be so definite about this date now is that we can all start to plan around it. As Labour looks at that date, does it does it start to firm up its commitment to certain policies, for example, schools? Well, I I think we've been very um, very clear on that because you've got to have the confidence of parents and of teachers. And I think what's been shown by research that we've done in our own constituencies with parents is it is about confidence. And that confidence has to come from working with local GPs, with schools, to make sure that parents have the confidence to return. I do want to see us returning where we can to uh, to the normal life that we've sort of, uh, you know, we, we left behind mm. uh, with lockdown. And that is important because it is going to be part of how we get the nation kind of back okay. to some sort of let, new normal. Let me just but go back to... it has got to be done safely. And it's got, to, if I can make this point, the point that Jonathan Ashworth has made very importantly today, we've got to have the resources for public health officials. We've got to have the resources and a, and a strategy for what we do with the outcomes of the tests. Because if they're not followed up and if the staff aren't trained who are going to be working on this system, we'll lose confidence very, very quickly. Uh, Christoph Fraser, when we talk about the system, it was interesting in James's uh, piece earlier, he said the app is a bit of a red herring, that really it comes down to the nuts and bolts of public health, that actually we've all been slightly wound up on the technology and there were much simpler, slightly more mundane systems that we, we could have been affecting all along. Well, there, I would say that it's a bit, bit more complicated than that. I think the systems are, are highly complementary. One of the, the sort of scientific problems um, that the, the app is, is there to address is that a peculiarity of this virus, of the, of the COVID virus, is that it's transmitted um, relatively quickly before people develop symptoms. So the aim of contact tracing is to, for people to be notified either through a phone call or through a notification through the app uh, that you're potentially uh, infectious and therefore, you know, that you, could, that you should isolate yourself um, and, and, and therefore prevent the spread of infection. But that has to happen very quickly. Yeah. And uh, the, the sort of limitations of, of manual contact tracing are certainly, you know, in the early stages that, that sometimes that, that, that can be a bit too late. So, okay. so actually having the systems working in parallel where the, the app gives you, you know, the information that, that you've been exposed and then you can get more information either through websites or through a phone call with a, a manual contact tracer. Uh, you know, that, that can... They need to work together. systems together can yeah. prevent more infections. All right. And Thank you. Manual, yeah. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you very much.